I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Hey Frank. Yep. What Bible character was the best musician? Samson. He brought the house down. Oh, yeah, <laughs> welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. Your free gifts are in the description, so go take your scripture prescriptions. I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. We'll start reading in verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him, speaking of Jesus, on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, so the devil is quoting Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Look at how Jesus answers. Then said Jesus unto him, and I want you to remember these words, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The Pauline Church, the body of Christ, is the most attacked faith on earth. There are literally two, three, and even four sides to every biblical doctrine that you're going to find. Every side created a quote-unquote church according to the belief that they have established for themselves, the way that they interpret the scriptures. Jesus is God. Jesus Christ is not God. There's a trinity. There's a compound unity. No, there is no trinity. The rapture. It's pre-trib. No, it's mid-trib. No, it's post-trib. No, there is no rapture. Salvation is by works. No, salvation is by faith. Whatever your belief is in what I just said, either or, there is a group of people that actually believes that. Now, does it mean that they're right? Absolutely not. Truth is exclusive. It's your responsibility for you to go search the scriptures whether those things are so. If you're just started in the faith, it's normal. I started off in the faith and I was taught all kinds of stuff that was wrong. As time went on, I asked a million and six questions. And as I was getting the answers, okay, this is bad, this is coming in. Okay, this is wrong, I'm keeping what I already have. There's already a series that I did. What do you believe and where do you get it from? If you have a chance, watch that series. It's for you. Which is right. The main key to understanding the Bible is found in 2 Timothy 2.15. I want you to turn there now. This is a key that God through Paul gave every believer. If you use it, great. If you don't use it, you're going to be locked outside. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And while you're at it, memorize this verse. I said all this to say this. When someone says, it is written, you should be ready to reply, if you find he or she is wrong, by saying, it is written again. Do you know how many people are ready to tell you, the Bible says it is written like this. And it's very important for you to know your scriptures to be able to say what you just gave me is invalid in the situation that we're in. I already told you the story many years ago. I was in one of the churches. I used to work as a waiter. Start at 12 o'clock, finish at 4 o'clock in the morning. So I used to pull that 14, 16, 18 hours, whatever it was. I used to come home racked. Between 4 and 8, I would sleep. I told my wife, you get the kids ready. When it's time to leave, you wake me up five minutes before. I want the kids with their coats on because I got one eye closed and the other eye is in my pocket for how tired I was. And we would go off to church. One day I got pulled into the office for the, uh, the preacher. He goes, Frank, he goes, I need to talk to you. So he was a preacher that I guess he didn't believe in drinking wine and strong drink and whatever else. So he tells me, he says, God's not happy with you. He's sitting behind his desk. I'm standing there. And I go, okay. And I went like this. I go, okay, now what did I do? He goes, God's not happy with you. I go, what? I didn't get the memo. So he tells us, says, oh, you know, you work in a place, you're serving booze, you know what the Bible says about the booze. So he starts off with his little rant. And I said, uh, and I go, so what am I supposed to do? Quit my job. What am I going to do? If I quit my job, I won't be able to pay my rent. Don't worry, God's going to take care of you. It doesn't work like that. You never leave a job, says God's going to find me a job. It doesn't work like that. I did that a couple of times. I planted my nose in the ground so many times that you just don't do that. So I put my, my hands on his desk. I leaned over and I says, his name was Bob. I says, Bob, we have a problem here. I go, we have a mean problem. What are we going to do with Nehemiah? Nehemiah was the king's cup bearer and I told him I says and it wasn't grape juice that he had in the king's cup it was full-fledged alcohol 
This guy was getting plastered every night. And yet, God used Nehemiah to go back, rebuild Jerusalem, and basically start the whole thing up over again. So what are we going to do with that? You know what the guy did? I was about to plant him one. He just rocks in his chair and goes, ah, ha, ha, Frank, that's a good one. Very good, very good. And I looked at him in disgust. I turned around and I walked out of his office. If I wasn't reading my Bible, I would have quit my job like I did prior to that. Somebody says, it is written. I turned around and says, it is written again. You've got to be able to turn around and say, it is written again. And if the person sticks around and doesn't run away, the truth will be revealed in that conversation that's going to be going back and forth. Either you're wrong or he's wrong. Because truth is exclusive. You're never going to find that black is white and white is black. You're never going to find that. Either white is white, black is black. Okay, we got a truth there. But to tell me that black is white, no, there's something wrong there. Have you noticed every time someone comes amongst this group, We've already had, I think I'm up at six or seven people that came in trying to disrupt and break up the group that we have here. So if you've noticed, every time someone comes amongst us quoting the Bible saying, it is written, and then they're showing us how wrong we are. Have you noticed how they lay their deceptive, misquoted, and out of context verses to push their heresy on us? And when we say it is written again, did you notice how the dust off my floor comes up because they're running so fast out the door? Mm. And how many times did I prepare stuff? They said what they had to say. When it's my turn to say something, all of a sudden they're up and out of the door. You know why? Because I applied Acts 1711. If you don't know what it is, go check it out. So our last friend basically never came back. The study that I'm doing tonight, I was supposed to do two weeks ago. I was waiting for him to come back. The amount of stuff that this guy was so beside the track is not funny. And I fear for the guy's salvation. So basically he came in here saying, it is written. I turned around and it says, it is written again. But I feel bad because he won't be listening to it is written again. Because he already picked up his skirt and he ran off. One main point I got from the letter we all received is that he disagrees with me with the mode of salvation that I preach and teach. Thus, indirectly, he was accusing me of heresy. And this is what he had said a couple of weeks prior before he gave us the letter. Now, I say this on the fact that this paper mainly focuses on this. And since you all received his interpretation of the Bible, along with his contact information, if you remember, he gave you his phone number, his address, his email, and everything else, how to contact him, that he's inviting you to reach out to him for proper biblical teaching. That's what that meant. I call that an act of war. The whole of this letter, we here are all in danger of eternal damnation because we do not keep the Ten Commandments. And I hope tonight I'm going to be able to sort of like uh, uh, push out this mist and actually see what we're supposed to be standing on and what the actual foundation is. So basically, on the paper he gave us, his choice verses basically points to that. If you contrast his summary of the salvation verses he uses to lay down his doctrine of salvation, which is the keeping of, I quote, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. This is his foundation, and this is what keeps ringing in my ear, not only here, but even prior to that when I knew him even many years ago. This is the only thing that he's got riveted in his mind. So he uses Exodus 34, 28 to lay his doctrine down. According to Paul, this is a works by the law based righteousness or salvation. That is the keeping of the Ten Commandments. Why does Moses say, which our friend seems to conveniently have left out? What does Moses say? I want you to turn to Exodus 34, 28. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So, so this is his main premise that he's coming from. The question is now, who were the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, given to? God gave this to Moses. Who was Moses supposed to give it to? Those in Christ under the gospel of the grace of God? I don't think so. Read the context, which our friend didn't do. It's found one verse before. So go to verse 27. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant 
with thee, speaking of Moses, and with Israel, not with those that are in Christ, not with those that are in the Pauline church. Do you see that? So he took a verse and right away he takes it out of context. The verse before actually gives you what the context is. So this verse refers to Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, which is foundational to the covenant with Israel and not the Pauline church. What does Paul have to say now? I want you to turn to Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Paul emphasizes here that justification cannot come through the law. So our friend, he is basing his righteousness on the actual law. Now I want you to notice what Paul is saying in Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man, underline that, is not justified by the works of the law. But how is he justified? Keep reading. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. I think it's pretty clear. For by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified, including our friend. So this verse directly addresses the issue of righteousness through works versus faith. So he is, you have to keep the Ten Commandments. And Paul says, no, you don't have to. Why? Because Christ is the end of righteousness. I want you to turn to Galatians 3.10 now. Watch what Paul says to the Galatians. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Our friend is only keeping the Ten Commandments. Did you know that he's got another 603 commandments, technically, that he should be keeping? But he's not doing that. Concerning Galatians 3.10 now, here Paul points out the limitations and the consequences of relying on the law for righteousness. So while Paul does not directly quote Exodus 34:28, he clearly articulates that salvation is not based on the works of the law. He makes sure that he says it, such as keeping the Ten Commandments. Instead, Paul argues for justification through faith in Christ. The verses from Romans and Galatians provide a clear contrast to the concept of a works-based righteousness. Now, how else does Paul contrast Moses' righteousness versus God's righteousness? In the next verse, in Romans 10.3, Paul delineates Moses' law which creates a personal righteousness versus the righteousness God gives as a free gift. You know the books that are going to be opened and another book which is the book of life at the great white throne judgment? Okay. All of the good things you've done, all of the bad things you've done, everything is going to be written in those books that are going to be opened. That's the personal righteousness that you're creating under the Mosaic law. But the righteousness which God gives is a free gift. So Romans 10.3 now. For they, speaking of Israel, you'll see this in verse 1, being ignorant of God's righteousness. Do you see the differentiation here? For they, Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. Where are they getting it from? They're getting it from the Mosaic law. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Where does this righteousness come from? It's Jesus Christ, the finished work that he did on the cross. Question, what is the righteousness of God? It's belief in Jesus Christ. Faith and not by words. Yep. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Underline that. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. We're talking about the Mosaic law. To everyone that believeth. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He just finished the law for you. This is what was completed, that Jesus Christ completed in the Old Testament. Verse 5, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. So Moses is giving you the righteous. There is a righteousness in the law. But we are not under that economy. We're not under that administration. Or I'm going to use the dirty word dispensation. Okay? We are not under that time period. That the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Question. What is the righteousness of God? 
The righteousness of God is a free gift that many, especially many in Christianity, are oblivious to. They do not know that it's even a gift. This is what hurts my heart. The guy sitting in the pew, you want to study, you want to read. And the guy that's up there at the pulpit, behind the pulpit, my friend, you're going to be getting it bad. Now, if you don't believe me, I want you to ask people when you're talking to them, ask them, what do you need to do to enter into heaven? 99% will tell you that you have to be good and that you have to follow God's commandment in one way, shape or form. Basically to get into heaven. So these so-called quote-unquote Christians should be called people. Because people are oblivious to what God actually said through Paul. I want you to go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 15 now. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Underline that. 1. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, the gift. Number 2. By grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. Underline that, so we're up at three now. The gift is mentioned three times. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift, we're up at four, is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of, look at this, number five, the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, read it again, underline it six times, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So one was Adam, one was Christ. Exactly. But did you notice the free gift? For by grace are you saved through faith and not not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you have to go to church? Absolutely not. Church is supposed to be there for the edification of you. That's part of the body of Christ. Not a particular name stamped on your head. I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm a Pentecostal. I'm an Episcopalian. I'm a, Pre a Presbyterian. I'm an Anglican. I'm a... Idiot, yes. Okay. You got all kinds of people out there that God's not looking for that. God's looking at what you got in your heart. I got another question for you. What does the gift of righteousness mean? The work has already been done. Read my lips. The gift of righteousness means the work has already been done by Jesus Christ on the cross. What does that mean? When Jesus Christ was on that cross, you picture yourself on that cross. And he says, you know what? Come down, I will take your place. That's what it means. There is nothing more you can do or add to this righteousness. It's a gift that He has to give you. If you got to work through it, Ten Commandments, keeping the Sabbath, and whatever else is under the sun, under the Mosaic Law, then you are not under grace anymore. You are under works. And there's a work that you have to do. Quote from our friend, God created people in His image, and he intended that they would live according to his own values. His values he gave to them, written on the two tables of stone. End quote. Basically, he was talking about the Ten Commandments. What do we do from Adam all the way up to Moses? They didn't have those stones written with the finger of God and whatever commandments were on there. What do we do with 2,500 years worth of humanity that never heard those words? So this guy's out to lunch. For the sake of time, I'm going to summarize the verses he used to lay his salvation doctrine down. As we read the next verses, I want you to notice the word covenant. Now, in his paper, he bolded, capitalized uh, certain words. I'm going to read them very quickly. Words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, the everlasting covenant, my covenant, everlasting covenant. And then he says the testimony of God and the Ten Commandments of God are two different names for what God has written with his own hand on the two tables of stone. Obeying or disobeying the covenant of God is a matter of eternal life or eternal damnation. So he was saying these are the covenants of God. You break God's covenant, you're basically in danger of eternal fire. Yeah, but we're not under the Mosaic law. 
We are under grace, the gospel of the grace of God. We are under a different administration. God is working with humanity in a different way right now. At one point he says, covenant breakers worthy of death. So basically, if you don't keep the covenant of God, you're basically frit and banat. You're going to die and go to hell. Okay, so let's go. This string of verses sounds impressive that I'm going to be reading. And to make his point of keeping the Ten Commandments for salvation, especially the Sabbath. But when you take a closer look, all of these verses have been taken out of their context. God was explaining something. The guy heard something else. So he takes it out of context and he puts everything together to prove a point that doesn't exist, thus creating a heresy. So he said, it is written. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a few of his verses and then I'm going to start showing you where this guy just went off the rails. Exodus 34, 28. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables... The words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and he highlights this and he puts it everything in capital letters. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony, this is capitalized, in Moses' hand, when he came down from the Mount, that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Here's another verse that he took out of context, Isaiah 24 and verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Again, he put this in capital letters. Psalm 89 28 now. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. And my covenant, again he capitalizes it, shall stand fast with him. Then he went to Hebrews 13 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So now I'm quoting from him. The testimony of God and the Ten Commandments of God are two different names for what God has written with his own hand on the two tables of stone, obeying or disobeying this covenant of God is a matter of eternal life, eternal damnation." End quote. These covenants are different covenants ascribed to different people in different situations. This covenant to our friend, not to name him, according to him is the Ten Commandments. Every time you see the word covenant, it doesn't mean the Ten Commandments. People see the word church and they go berserk. Did you know that there was a church in the Old Testament? That was Israel. Did you know that there's a church called the body of Christ? Did you know that there's a church in Revelation? These are the body of believers. These are the tribulation saints. The word church just means a gathering of people. A called out assembly. That's all it means. And all of a sudden, people see that one word. No, no, this word means this in every context. It doesn't mean that. Read the context. So now it's my turn. So he says it is written. I just gave you the verses. It's my turn. So it is written again. Number one, the context of Exodus chapter 34, verse 28 and 29 is given to Israel and their proselytes. Proselyte is somebody who converts to Judaism. Not the Pauline church. If it was given to the Pauline church, show me clearly where it actually is. And we saw the context in verse 27. Don't go there. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words have I made my covenant with thee and with Israel. He didn't make it with the church. Number two, he took Psalm 89, 28 out of context. He made it say something that it wasn't saying. The covenant was a promise of God made with King David, not man. Our friend took it to mean that it was a covenant for him and to all those that would keep it. He just perverted the scriptures. Turn to Psalm 89, verse 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. God chose David. He says, I've made a covenant with my chosen, and he tells you who the chosen is. It's David, not our friend or the people that believe in it. Verse 4, Thy, speaking of David's seed, will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. Jump down to verse 20 now. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him. Verse 21, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm shall strengthen him. Speaking of David, again in verse 20. Jump down to verse 24 now. 
But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, again speaking of David, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Jump down to verse 28 now. My mercy will I keep for him, again speaking for David, forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him, speaking of David. He thinks that the verse is speaking to him and to all people that are going to keep the covenant. You cannot keep the Davidic covenant. It was promised to David and his downline, to all of his children. Are you part of the Davidic line? No, you're not. This is the covenant that he basically took out of context. So the context of Psalm 89 is reflecting on God's promises to David and his descendants. In this verse, God reaffirms his Davidic covenant, which he has promised to establish David's throne forever. This promise is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ because he comes from the lineage of Jesus Christ, the descendant of David who reigns eternally as king. He will literally sit in Jerusalem. Jesus is not reigning right now. He is not in the heavens like the preterists are saying or like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus is not in the heavens. He will actually descend. And once he's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives, He's going to defeat his enemies, he's going to clear the land, and he's going to start his millennial reign here on earth, visibly that everybody can see him. So the interpretation is this. The covenant referred to in this verse is the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. God promised David that his throne would be established forever. This is fulfilled in Christ, the eternal king from David's line. God's mercy and faithfulness to this covenant is emphasized even when David's descendants failed to live up to their responsibilities. So I want you to turn to 2 Samuel now. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, it's going to die, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. This is the Davidic covenant. So the verse that he actually took out of context was Psalm 89, 28. My mercy will I keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. So he sees the word covenant, he's freaking out, and this is what we have to do. And my mercy will I keep for him forevermore. So his mercy, according to him, he goes, I see the covenant, I'm going to keep it, then I'm going to have my peace. But you're taking something that was given to somebody else. Number three. The everlasting covenant of Hebrews 13.20 is found in the blood of Jesus, the Messiah. The law being a schoolmaster brought us to the faith of Jesus Christ. You'll find this in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 23 through 26. And the law of righteousness ends with Jesus Christ. We find this in Romans chapter 10 verses 3 and 4. So this everlasting covenant, quote unquote, all in capital letters, has nothing to do with the keeping of any Ten Commandments, which our friend is trying so hard to squeeze basically down our throats sideways without Vaseline. Galatians 3.23, let's go see what Paul says to the Galatians. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, not the Ten Commandments and not the Mosaic Law. 25. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, which is the law. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 10.3 now. For they, speaking of Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So what's the context of Hebrews 13.20 now? It points directly to the new covenant established through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
This covenant is everlasting because it is the ultimate fulfillment of God's redemptive plan for humanity. It was prophesied in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 31 and fulfilled in Christ's death and resurrection. Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, future tense, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The everlasting covenant of Hebrews 13.20 refers to the new covenant established through the sacrificial death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this covenant provides eternal redemption and salvation to all who believe. It contrasts the old covenant, the Mosaic law, which was temporary and could not provide eternal salvation. Do you know what's going to give you eternal salvation? I want you to watch this three minute video. It's for your own good.